On a weekly basis, someone tells me it's completely Im impossible. <laughs> the phrase moonshot is a big one that is often thrown around. We are building a piece of hardware that is called a Zydro. A bit like the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. <laughs> it's sort of like this portal <laughs> yes. that transports you into exactly a magical place. Exactly that. Imagine it like a pod. And within this pod, we house top of the range graphics, VR, scent, surround sound, wind. We can transport customers in back in time, into the future, into somewhere that doesn't even exist. The last thing on our mind is actually recreating a shopping center as we know it today. <laughs> we don't even go to physical ones, yeah. let alone imaginary yeah. ones. Talking about the metaverse, yeah. what is it and why should we care? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question because Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Nell, thank you so much for coming onto the show. It's, it's been pleasure. a while since we saw each other. Such a pleasure to have you here and just really, really fascinated with what you're doing. So I don't want to kind of put words in your mouth. So I'd love for <laughs> you to explain what Zydrobe is, in which you are a co-founder of. Yes. So Zydrobe is something brand, brand new. I always find it really interesting to try and explain it to people for the first time ever. But the easiest way of describing it is that we are building a piece of hardware, first and foremost. Um, this is something that is called a Zydrobe. It's an immersive one-person experience. So imagine it like a pod. And within this pod, we house VR, so top of the range graphics, VR, scent, surround sound, wind, uh, with the aim that we create a kind of the most immersive experience we possibly can for VR. Um, and this is something we're working on for luxury brands in particular. Uh, so these physical units will be something that brands will have in their physical locations. Right. Whether that's in their retail locations or in dedicated spaces for the Zydrobes uh, with an aim that they start engaging with uh, virtual content in a, a meaningful way for their customers. So this is a bit like the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. <laughs> is yeah. that, is, so it was like this portal <laughs> yes. that transfor you know, transports you into exactly a that. magical place. Exactly that. The way we like to describe it is it's a portal. It's a little bit like a TARDIS. Mm -hmm. uh, so you step inside of it and the, the glory of it is that brands can create whatever they want. Um, and we really try and inspire the brands to create content that goes beyond anything we've ever seen before. Um, so that doesn't look like real world footage. It can do sometimes, um, but we really do try to delve into more computer generated imagery so that they really can play around with their creativity and we can transport customers into back in time, into the future, into somewhere that doesn't even exist. It's really up to our brands what they want to put in there. But the exciting thing for the consumer is that they get all senses um, played with in a really, really exciting way. That's incredible. Yeah. That's really, I'm just, you know, just sort of picturing in going into 
I don't know, like a Louis Vuitton store mm-hmm. or a Burberry. And to be honest, I haven't even been in physical stores for a long time. Right. But just going somewhere where you literally are transported mm. into something completely different and yeah. to give that sort of retail experience a completely, you know, we're talking about theatre. It's and, real theatre. You know, and, and customer experience. And this is kind of taking it to a whole nother level. Exactly. And mm. I think that was really the main point for us. Obviously there are plans in the future to make it a commercial experience so people can actually buy real product inside of it um but first and foremost it's it's about the experience side of it and providing a customer with something that they've never ever experienced before Mm. um so that's really really exciting for us obviously whether or not brands put them into their existing retail locations we've been seeing that a lot of brands are considering this as something that sits outside of their physical retail locations in spaces that previously Obviously, you wouldn't have been able to go and visit a Louis Vuitton or a Burberry and you'd be able to go into this dedicated space and explore the brand's DNA in a way that they might not want to do in their physical space. I can just imagine the queues into the pods now. Right. A person Is it a one-person experience? It is a one-person mm-hmm. experience and we did it that way because we felt it was going to be the most kind of private. I think that was an important thing for us because we designed the Zydrobes really as a response to noticing that luxury brands uh, wanting to engage with virtual experience. However, there was no appropriate tool um, for their consumers who feel as though, you know, putting on a VR headset might be a little uncomfortable. It might be slightly embarrassing having to stand in the side of a, a shop and put on a VR headset. You know, you don't want other people to see you while you're not seeing them. Mm-hmm. And so we designed the Zydro with, you know, privacy being one thing, But then also that kind of the best experience possible being the other priority of ours. So we knew that designing something around one person was going to just be a lot more successful than trying to design a a um, multi-person experience. And where did the idea, the inspiration, where did that come from? Um... A a lot of places, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Lots and lots of places. We started working with Givenchy a little while ago, since the beginning of the year, um, directly with the visual merchandising team, which was a fascinating experience because a lot of that was for just traditional visual effects assets that we were going to put into their store to provide them with something that was really exciting for their their customer in a way that... Um, you know, using LED screens, interactive LED screens. We were really kind of trying to test the boundaries of what's really out there. Um, And then it begged the question of going, okay, well, what's the next step? What's the next thing that we can do that's beyond LED screens? It's beyond what we've seen before. Um, And for me, it was was the obvious answer of going, well, VR is the next thing, but not just VR. We wanted to design something that was really special and I think the main inspiration came out of knowing that there is this huge creative potential and that's really what excited us the most about what the Zydro was able to do and so it was really driven out of just wanting to go okay what if the walls didn't exist what if gravity didn't exist you know we often had conversations with the with the creative team at Shivanshi about what it is we could really do and we'd have these kind of out there chats about oh what if we could have you know the shoe coming out of the wall and weaving down and through your eye view and that was something that we always felt limitations applied because we were dealing with physical space and you know creativity is born out of limitations a lot of time however there was this tool that we knew existed um and for me the the problem lay in why brands weren't engaging with that in a, in a real way and part of it was what we'd seen before and then part of it was actually okay let's create something that's gonna have a, a meaningful impact on the luxury space and how they engage with the future mm-hmm. of web3 if you want to call it that um more just the next frontier of digital 
Matthew Drinkwater, who came onto the show, yeah. <laughs> when he was saying, it's like, well, you know, because obviously they're doing a lot of innovation within the space. Yeah, and he's course. talking about, you know, the future of um, fashion, the future of metaverse and yeah. VR. And he's like, I'll be very disappointed <laughs> if you just, you know, put on your he- you know headset and you're just transported in yet another shopping center. Totally. And yeah. it's like, you know, please, please, please begging everyone just to be very creative and to exactly that. Yeah, have something that you wouldn't even have thought of. It's exactly that. That is one of the things that frustrates me as well. And it resonated with me when I when I listened to him say that, because um, what we'd seen previously was just store environments that exist in real life, runways that look like runways, you know, real captured footage that's you know great and serves an amazing purpose in a lot of ways but it doesn't test the limits of what we can really achieve um and so what we're trying to inspire with the brands that we're working with is is really to say what happens if we play with scale and excitingly they're all really up for the challenge and thinking about it in a new way and it's going to be a little a little pathway of of the learning steps between what we know to be possible now and what we know to be possible tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, But I completely agree. That's the last thing on our mind is actually recreating a shopping centre as we know it today. (laughs) (laughs) We don't even go to physical ones, let alone imaginary ones. And why did you choose the luxury space? Mm. Luxury for us, it was a couple of factors. I think that what it meant was that we could focus on the quality of the graphics first and foremost. And there's, I could get into the really boring pipeline steps of what it takes to create a mass environment. But I think what we know already existing out there from Decentraland to what Meta are doing, their main agenda is obviously to create a virtual space that loads and loads of people can inhabit at any given time and for that reason they obviously there are limitations at play there in terms of the graphics capability making sure that the actual environment isn't too heavy it's not laggy when someone's inside of it Um, so that puts a set of limitations on what um, you can achieve with the graphics and so for us it was actually going okay well we need to for us it was the other end of the scale we wanted to create something that looked as beautiful as we possibly could because we knew that the brands that we were engaging with they were excited about using virtual and there's so many use cases for um from what balenciaga's done in Fortnite. um there's obviously a huge user base there that already exists but in terms of their existing user consumer Um, base there's this whole side of um, a generation that aren't used to gaming and so the graphics capability was really important for us which meant we needed to design something that wasn't for everyone at least at first we needed to focus on something that was quality um, over quantity and that spoke to luxury in a way that um, may not with more mass consumer brands Mm. Um, there's a lot as well to say about how luxury is so much of luxury is about a the theater of retail um and then also the storytelling behind it so many of these brands have these amazing rich histories um that is part and parcel of why they're luxury in the first place and i think this at its very best is just a fantastic storytelling tool and so it just made the most sense for us to target a kind of a market that was so focused on their heritage. Mm. Well, I mean, for luxury, it's the it's the sort of immersive experience that yeah. you're supposed to have when you walk into a boutique. Exactly. And the storytelling, not just of the brand and the marketing and what you see on social media, mm. but also through how the store staff approach you mm. and how exactly. you're being treated, you know, when you return back into the store. So that makes absolute sense. Exactly. And are you finding that these luxury brands are being receptive? I mean, I know, obviously, you know, the the most obvious players like Balenciaga, as you're talking about yeah. Givenchy, you're talking about, yeah. you know, Gucci as well. Yeah. So what are you finding, you know, what's the the response from these luxury brands? It's really exciting. Um, We've had an overwhelming positive response, actually. I mean, it's been a relatively quick process for us. We started talking to brands about it officially in May this year, um, after many months of iterations of what the concept was going to be. 
it's been overwhelming. And I think the thing I would say, which touches on what you just said about the theatre of retail and how how curated their experience is and has to be as a, as a result. You know, they as a company um, have designed everything from how someone says hello to you when you walk through the door through to the way that they take the clothes from you from the changing rooms to the cashier desk. And the amazing thing about Zydrobe that allowed them to actually want to start engaging with it is obviously one thing is the graphics capability. That's, that's great. But the main thing for them, I think, was the ability to control the experience because what it means is that they're not just relying on a VR headset. There's actually, you know, we as Zydrobe are a company that are aligned with the luxury brands first and foremost, less aligned with the tech side of things, much more focused on who they are. And so I think there's a level of trust there that allowed them to actually being receptive to it for the first time um we're very proud of the fact that we've been the first company that they're actually wanting to engage with this on um and i hope that the control aspect to the zydrobe means that they're going to be able to start converting a consumer base of theirs that already exists um into some people who might want to actually start using vr for not just in a retail experience but also at home hmm. who else are you competing against in this space it's a really interesting question because we often find ourselves considering our competitors to be traditional retailers um, we often think about it as well if we want to look to the best shopping experience possible then really we look to the existing shopping experiences that are the best in the world, like Selfridges, like Harrods. Um, we're less about trying to compete with existing technology companies that I know are doing really interesting things in the space because our main uh, value add outside of the immersive quality of the Zydrobe and um, and what we're doing with the actual graphics is is really about the brands that we're engaging with. And the brands we're engaging with are the same as the companies that I was just talking about there. So Selfridges and Harrods and Bergdorf Goodmans, you know, they're all focused on physical retail and creating an amazing experience. Um, and so for us, we we sort of treat those as our competitors because they, they form a bit of a benchmark for us that we want to achieve. Um, and that's what we try and emulate with our company despite it being a tech company and despite looking as as alien as it does um at our very core we're trying to create a luxury experience and mm. they know how to do that very well so yeah you're talking about that the business main focus is you know the hardware the pods mm. but when i first saw you you were talking about nfts and creating right. you know these like incredible trainer for Givenchy talking yeah. about you know this sort of you know digital cardigan for yeah. Harry Styles in collaboration with JW Anderson yes. is that no longer the focus or right it okay. is it is okay but it's the future of the product so first and foremost we are producing the hardware we're also producing the content that can sit inside the hardware um what we're going to be working on next year is the build out of the multi-brand space, which is going to be something that consumers can access from home, um, which is going to be basically taking all of the bits of content that exists inside the physical Zydrobes in our brand's stores, in our brand's environments, and placing them into an agnostic landscape that means a customer can go to uh, the Zydrobe application, in theory, and go and access all of the branded experiences at one time. Um, we're trying to integrate that with when we can build in commercialized aspects, so being able to buy real product. Um, that's really the future of the company from a Zydro perspective. Um, so we'll be morphing from just being a hardware company to being something that represents luxury virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And for our listeners who don't necessarily know about these projects, can you talk a little bit more about those? Um, about J.W. Anderson or yeah. Shivanshi? Or okay. both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the in our initial iteration as a, as a business, we set to work basically just providing luxury companies with digital support, whether that looks like strategy, asset creation, that can span from Web3, NFT, crypto side of things through to traditional um, digital content that they can put on LED screens. 
one of our first um, clients was JW Anderson, and we produced a really amazing NFT um, in support of an amazing charity. And that was a really special project for us because it allowed us, you know, it was the first time we were working as business. Um, it seems crazy to say, actually, because that was really a year ago that we did that. Um, and we created a completely hyper-realistic version of a piece of physical IP that already existed. And the reason I'm saying it in such kind of unsexy terms is because it was the first time anyone had ever done that. It was the first time we'd ever engaged um, in IP understanding of, okay, there's a, card a cardigan that exists in real life that's incredibly valuable. Um, we want that tra to translate into NFT category because we'd seen so many NFTs that existed. A lot of brands had created um, some NFTs that were mostly digital, whether that was artwork or whether that was purely digital fashion. Um, and so we took this bit of physical IP, which was the Harry Styles cardigan, um, that they wanted to produce something that was really special as the kind of swan song of the, of the cardigan, because it had, um, such an amazing marketing boom, um, such an amazing effect on the, on the community, especially on TikTok. Um, and so we took that cardigan and we recreated it perfectly um, in CG and then we sold that as an NFT. We raised seven and a half thousand pounds for charity, which was fantastic. Um, and it still exists today. I kind of check on it every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Like, what's going on with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so um, that was a really fantastic project and it allowed us to really benchmark the quality of digital work. That's always kind of what we've held at our core is, is our integrity with the actual quality of the work we're producing, um, which led us on to work with Givenchy. Um, the kind of relationship that we have with Givenchy is, is multifaceted. There is um, a level of strategy that we perform with them. We mostly work with the visual merchandising team um, which is a really fascinating area that I would never have predicted that that would have been our main focus. You know, these big companies have digital um, digital teams. They have huge digital sectors that look after all of that work. And actually, primarily, we're working with the visual merchandisers because the amazing thing about Givenchy is they have an incredibly forward-thinking team and they wanted to do something really cool that no one else had done before. And I think we were able to help them on trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, in store, working on specifically the launch of the TK360, which was Matthew Williams' um, first sneaker for the house, like the first house silhouette. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. And we did everything from helping them source the LED screens that we wanted to put in stores. We created the content. Um, we produced four different bits of content that was going to sit on socials, on e-com, um, on merch, even went on coffee cups, actually. Um, and so that was, that was really amazing. And I think that provided us a huge amount of insight into how brands like Givenchy and like JW Anderson, how they work, how they like to work, how they're thinking about their future. Um, something that we would never have achieved, you know, Zydro wouldn't be where it is today without having that understanding of the space, listening and learning from the brands being the the main thing that we were really doing. We weren't trying to impose what we thought was right at that time. It was much more about understanding what they want, um, which meant that we could create Zydrobe, the hardware, the future of the product, um, with the understanding, which is probably what I would say attests to the, the kind of, uh, the reception that it's had since we put it to market. Um, is as a result of that listening exercise that we did mm. um, in the first iteration of the company. You must remind me after we sort of stopped talking, I have someone that I think I should introduce you to. Yes. Um, that might be an interesting collaboration. Amazing. And also, fun fact. Fun fact, yeah. <laughs> I placed the first CEO for J.W. Anderson. No way. He did. Years no and years way. ago. But it's not the, the current person. no. It's not Simon. Yes. It is Simon Whitehouse. Yes. No way. Yeah. I don't think we've ever met. We've, yeah. um, 
we've been connected on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. he's amazing. He yeah. was on the show as well. Amazing. He's just one of the most amazing people that I right. have come across. Love it. And uh, love him. Great. Love him very much. But um, And I've lost... My track of thought <laughs> promoting myself here on <laughs> on the show but talking about the metaverse yeah what is it and why should we care <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a good question because i often a lot of people ask me this question and i think that the main thing for me is it's that okay whatever meta are doing um it's a it's a phrase that really is used to describe a virtual landscape that can house lots and lots of people at any given time. Uh, that can be anyone's. It's not just going to belong to Meta. There isn't just going to be one Metaverse. I think that's a common misconception. Um, there's going to be loads. There's going to be hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Metaverses um, that will exist. People will hopefully in the future be able to create um, their own virtual social spaces if that's what they're really going for um so for me i i tend to steer away from using the word metaverse just purely because i'm much more interested in just what virtual reality is going to mean um for us it's it's about shopping experience but for another it could be about conveying an ideology it could be about creating a media space for newscasters to actually present their information in a different way it can be really whatever we want it to be um and that's why i think we should care about it because it is just it's another avenue for us to convey information potentially in a more immersive um potentially in a more compelling way than we're used to it's the same thing as what happened when the internet happened screens happened you know it's just it's just the next layer that's the only reason i think we should care about it is because we're all going to be immersed within it at some point Every single business, I would urge to start thinking about how you're going to be engaging with VR, how you're going to be engaging with immersive visuals. Um, do you have a strategy in place? You know, there's so many different angles from the gaming environments that are obviously very popular at the moment um, through to what we're doing and what lots of other people are going to start doing, which is creating environments specifically tailored towards different areas of a market, you know. Yes, Meta is an interesting um, proposition because they've got a huge, huge amount of users. Um, but there's going to be, I would, I would urge anyone to start thinking about what yours specifically could potentially look like away mm -hmm. from what Meta are doing. Um, and then thinking about the graphics is, is another big thing because um, there's obviously engines that are going to support all of these virtual reality locations so say you are a luxury brand yeah and you're like okay it sounds great amazing like where do i start what do right. i need to think about like right. what's your advice okay so it's multifaceted i think for a luxury brand it really does depend on are you trying to engage your existing consumer base or are you trying to actually branch your consumer base out into mm. different areas you mm. know um are you trying to get a younger clientele or are you trying to actually retain your existing loyal customers who maybe are looking for more customization in their in-store experience you know from the combination of using their phones um are there different layers that they're currently looking for that you can't achieve with what already exists or like I said, are you trying to engage a completely new different customer? That could be through a marketing boom. It could be through thinking about a gaming engine that a lot of younger users are using, um, like Fortnite. Um, and so the main thing for me is establish what you're really trying to achieve beyond what you think is going to capture the most headlines unless that's what you're going for you know there's a lot to say about having a huge marketing boom but i would say that if you're thinking about a long-term strategy i would focus holistically on on which category of consumer you're trying to target um, and hopefully what we're going to be producing is actually something that could naturally fit with your existing consumer base and then look at the gaming engines, um, the gaming environments that are stylized 
um, that have a younger consumer base already, if you're looking to do that, actually, it's, it's quite simple for me. It's, it mm. comes down to those two things. Mm. You came from a filming industry. Why did you decide to change? And then I have a follow-up question on that as well. Okay. <laughs> so the film industry is... Yeah, I'd been I'd been working in it since I was quite young. Um, loads of reasons. I always knew I wanted to set up my own business. I think that's important to say. I always always knew that. Um, from a strategic point of view, I knew that I needed to learn. I needed to have a craft that I was becoming very specialised in, and that I knew um, a lot about. And so, from the film industry, I went through my career and I, I feel like I I had achieved a certain level of what I was hoping to achieve in the film industry. And then really it was, you know, you have ideas all the time and some stick with you and then some don't and they kind of fall by the wayside. And then really there was just a big moment for me, which was uh, realising that there was this opportunity at play within the luxury space. I'd actually worked in fashion very briefly before I went into film um actually my co-founder was my boss back in the day oh, really Vivian Westwood. love yeah, that actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. um and so I, I you know I'm a lover of fashion I'm a lover of luxury in general and so I'd always kind of kept my eye on what was being produced and I think the thing that I'd noticed was sitting in these huge post-production facilities that I was lucky enough to work in, the level of work is phenomenal. You know, they have the bleeding edge of technology because really they are the leading industry in terms of what needing pro to produce unbelievably perfect graphics that could sit inside real, real footage that they'd shot. They mm -hmm. need to produce computer generated imagery that was indistinguishable from the from the rest of the the scene and so there's so much money that has been pumped into that industry to create the best um talent the best software the best kind of um protocol to actually produce that kind of material um but it was only being used for film and tv and advertising and it wasn't really spanning out into the luxury market from what i could see luxury brands weren't necessarily producing a similar level of quality um, and so that opportunity at play meant that I felt quite strongly I my two co-founders that I called when I'd had this idea and I couldn't really put it to bed and it was consuming me and I was thinking about it all the time um, they were both very very experienced in luxury and so I knew that we had an interesting kind of skill set base that meant we could potentially make something that was successful mm -hmm. and so that was really the the real reason behind me leaving film was that there was something that I was really excited about and I knew that we could potentially make it a success mm. what skills do you think you brought with you from that industry um yes so an understanding of how visual effects works um was really important because there's a certain level of understanding about how to produce something really beautiful but also how to produce something that might not look as beautiful, both equally valuable. Um, and you, when you're working in the visual effects industry, you get to know ways of producing material in a timely way, cost-effective way, um, and not a cost-effective way. <laughs> um, the amazing pool of artists, um, learning how artists like to work you know directors are very similar to creative directors in the fashion industry so there's a lot of understanding about how to manage clients who um, have a creative vision at play and it's your job to produce it to the best of your ability um, I think there's a lot of skill set around that that I've brought over um, from film which is a lot of client management and but also a deep understanding of the actual technology that you need to to use to produce it and a lot of honesty in that as well mm. in terms of um, it's a it's a quite niche industry to some anyone who exists outside of it and then when you're inside of it you realize the mammoth scale of it um, and yet there's very little sharing of knowledge into different markets. Mm. And so that was really important for me was that luxury brands feel as though they're not 
alienated by the information they don't feel um confused or it's not being gatekept in any way um so i think that's it knowledge base understanding of how to properly manage quite an intricate process um and also an understanding maybe a level of empathy as well which was something really really important is you know these are human beings at the end of the day they're still people producing the work it's, it's not a piece of software mm. yet a mm. lot of people think it's a press of a button it's a huge team hundreds of people that are producing this material so my job as a producer was to make sure that first and foremost the team were happy um but then there's a fine balance between making sure both sides of the coin are, are mm. happy and producing work at the best of their ability so yeah you're still very early in your journey, yeah. but anything that you would change looking back on it now? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things. I, th- I always, actually, I always struggle with this question because I'm a big believer in failure. <laughs> right. I'm a big believer in... <laughs> Unpack that for, yeah. for a bit. What do you mean by that? I have my own opinions, but I'd yeah. love to hear yours. I... Yeah. I I have failed a lot in my life. There's a lot of failure. There's a lot of trying um, and opportunities. You know, you try, you fail. Um, I'm not scared of failure in any way. And I think that we would never be in this position without the mistakes that we've made, whether that's small things, you know, understanding on the administration side, you know, setting up things in the right way. It was all our first time setting up a business really properly. Um, So... If I'm really honest, I probably wouldn't change anything. But if I was to give myself advice about some things, it would be, you know, um, as a female founder, I think there's a lot of information that is sort of not really spoken about, especially when it comes to fundraising. Um, A really key thing for me that I would urge any other female founder and myself is... um, learning how to talk about money really plainly, really easily, um, and not being afraid to ask for the number that you really, really need. I think there's... Is that how you felt? Yes. Yes, I did. And I do think that that was a... That has been the biggest learning curve for me, um, is having the confidence to say, yeah, no, I need need that much. Mm -hmm. This is how much I'm needing. And this is absolutely why I need it. There's no level of um a lack of confidence in really what what you know to be true i think very often as a woman in throughout my career you are sort of semi relied on to be nice you know you're supposed to be nice you're supposed to be agreeable s- agree about compliant agreeable, compliant <laughs> as a little um maybe shy about talking about things like that you know you, you know you're the slightly malleable creature often you're you're supposed to be um which hasn't always tallied up with who I am and I think it's about for me it was about unpicking a lot of learned behavior you know I've been working professionally since I was um 18 and so I had a lot of learned behavior to start to unpick to really put myself into a position where I was able to stand up on my two feet and ask for what I really needed um, which has been a huge, huge learning curve that I would, the advice I'd probably give my younger self, which is terrible advice and completely unuseful, but to say, start understanding how to voice your needs. When did you start doing that? Or mm. when was the moment you thought, actually, this is either not working for me or, yeah. you know, why am I doing this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> was there a specific moment or something happened or... Yes, yes, something did happen. I think it was, one. Well, lots of things happened. We had a lot of rejections, at least initially, a lot of um, no's from people that I've, I was really, really uh, confused, I think, because I felt as though we had every single checkbox really ticked off. You know, we had a credible idea, we had a problem that we were solving. It was a huge problem, it was a lot of market. Um, I'm talking, this was, this was when we first set up the company a while ago. Um, we had an existing client base, we had revenue, we had all of the things that I considered to be big tick boxes in terms of what's going to be projection into the future. And I think that what I noticed in myself and what really shifted um, the coin for me on that front was I'd had an instance where 
I suddenly, it was a bit of an out of body experience, but I recognized in myself that I was semi apologizing for needing to ask for money when really what I noticed was this is a fantastic idea and it's their job to want to invest in things that are brilliant idea, brilliant ideas even. Um, and why am I apologizing for it? You know, this is really, is their opportunity at play. It's not ours. Um, I guess that was the shift in me that I spent a night where after another failed conversation with a potential VC partner or an investor, and I was really trying to unpick it. I'm a big, maybe overthinker, overanalyzer. Um, and I was really thinking and processing how I was going to solve this problem for us. And it really was as simple as coming down to the fact that I needed to, I needed to really believe in myself first and foremost and then also what we built which was fantastic um, and as soon as that happened everything changed mm. this is it it's so much in the mind it really is yeah how we perceive ourselves our ideas yeah is what we project into the world yeah and if we're so cautious and we don't go out there we don't have the opportunity to receive feedback mm. either and I think that's where a lot of people just simply don't get started. Right. Because it's, it is terrifying. It's terrifying to put something, it's like, you know, out there in the world and you have, you know, you believe it's good. Yeah. And then, you know, you have the potential of other people to bring you down. Yeah. And is there anything that maybe externally, maybe not mm. internally, that made you be like, no, actually, this is an amazing idea. Mm. I do believe in that. Mm. No, well, let me think about that because I we'd had a lot of very positive feedback. We'd had the the main thing for us was noticing that the traction we were receiving from the brands. I think this was pre this is when we were in our iteration phase and we were really trying to figure out how we were going to produce the product that we have today, how we we're going to solve that problem. There was a lot of iteration around that. We knew the problem existed. What form our solution was going to take was something up to us that we needed to really figure out. And so we, like I said, I'm a big believer in failure in, in that I like it when we receive no's and we receive feedback because it means we can keep building our, our data set um, and understanding how, because we know we're going to achieve even better if we keep receiving really important feedback um, rather than being placated with sort of mediocre answers. I always push for proper, proper feedback from any of the clients that we work with um, and investors actually that we were we were talking to um, and so the external kind of driver for us to keep going really was the brand interaction we were having the excitement we had from the brands the excitement that we saw from people that we chose the product to it was a lot of excitement not only internally because that was by the by we all knew instinctively that this was something that we knew was going to be a success mm. um and we were all it didn't matter to us actually that the no's were happening we didn't really pay it that much attention apart from saying okay why why are you saying no because that's interesting to us because it means we can then shift maybe how we're talking about it maybe it's the words we're using that is proving a problem what if you know the visuals are wrong you know we need to get something slightly fixed because we knew that the core of the idea was good um so it was it was everything else outside of the funding side that we knew was great because there was a an amazing sense of excitement about what we were building mm. um and so that was that was really it Talking about raising funds as a female founder yes. and having that mindset, what other advice would you give to female founders looking for funds now? We have a struggle at play as female founders because we don't have, generally speaking, there's not an, an innate sense of trust with women um, as there are with men. Um, which is really difficult. Do you mean between women between women or no, women between, between men? men who are generally the the investment partners at VCs, they're generally men um, that you're speaking to. In fact, there's only been one VC I've spoken to, which has been my by far most positive experience um, was with a woman. Um, but generally speaking, you're speaking to men. 
and the sense of trust that often exists for generally tech founders who are men, generally they are men as well, in that they can have a really brilliant idea and have very little else to back it up. Um, and that's okay because there's a level of trust that they are going to pull it off. The thing I would say to women, whilst I don't want us to have to mitigate that gap in trust, the trust gap, um, what I would say always to myself, especially, is have the information, have everything. There's no, you can't give them any excuse to not believe in your idea because you know, you know what it is. You know everything about your product. You know the market. Um, you know what you need. And I think, um, I don't know the answer to building someone's confidence apart from to say, stop putting yourself in situations that make you really uncomfortable. I started doing talks like the one I met you at. That would, I would never have done that before. That completely freaks me out. Um, having these kinds of conversations, pitching to amazing companies and the C-suite at these amazing companies. Again, never something in a million years I would have thought that I would have been any good at. Um, but the more I started putting myself into situations because I really believed in the idea that we were we were talking about the more my confidence grew um i don't think there's a there's a like a quick solve but um i guess it comes down to knowing everything about your business knowing everything about your product um and don't be afraid to say yeah this is you know know your worth basically mm. it's about building your tolerance to being uncomfortable yeah and i think that makes a massive difference so when you're talking about failure and the mindset it's like the yeah. more you put yourself out there maybe bit by bit at first mm. the more you can build up that tolerance it's so often i hear myself saying it when i was younger i, th I hear female colleagues saying you know i'm not ready you're presented an opportunity no i'm not ready i don't think i'm good enough for this i think there's some there's loads of data that's been received about women putting themselves up for promotions in comparison to men and the skill set that they feel as though they need to have actually to put them even up for it regardless of even saying i should i should get it mm -hmm. um has shown us that I think we're often our, our biggest holdback is our own internal belief that we're not good enough yet when actually it's, it feels really uncomfortable even to say it actually but to to admit that no I am good enough I can do this I'm capable of this I don't think I, I will challenge you on that because yeah. I don't think it's just because we don't feel confident. Right. I do believe that there is also feedback coming at us. Oh, for sure. And when no, you're talking absolutely. about the funding yeah. and, you know, this is an example within sort of, you know, the investor yeah. founder relationship where majority are men yeah. who are not necessarily, you know, you don't represent them. They're somebody who's different. And we, we have biases, like whether we like to think we do, we don't, we mm. do. And you are much more likely to feel more comfortable with somebody who looks like you, who goes to the same university, sure. who is probably of the same gender, same age. And within the interview environment of when you're speaking to someone, if you don't have that initial trust because they're similar to you, mm. you're much more likely to grill them. Mm. You're much more likely to ask them difficult questions mm. as opposed to it's like, oh, you went to the same university as me, then you're the same as me, then you know you think like me, we're buddies, For I sure. trust you, let's go ahead. Yeah. And I think this is where we need to be aware of it yeah and also talk about well you know like you do need to know what you're talking about because you probably are going to be grilled for sure and asked more difficult questions and i say this about you know how to interview candidates mm. for your role you know whether you're looking for a ceo or whoever it is that you're bringing into your business it's like you yeah. have to be so aware are you really grilling that person because oh gosh yeah you don't feel that yeah, they represent yeah, yeah. you and, yeah. and on the reverse are you not asking enough deep questions to, because you just you're like, oh, they, you know, they're great. So, you know, let's just sort of, you know, not even go into that depth. For sure. So talking about the bias against women, I think there is it's something learned. to that. Oh, for sure. It's definitely, it's learned from external sources is what I mean. And the, what I would say to 
investors, if I was to give any advice to VCs, is to say, you know, um, to challenge the, the bias that they innately have and to start understanding why they're asking female founders what their future plans are for family planning. You know, there, there's a lot of that. There's still Don't exists. get me started. Yeah, there's a lot of that that I yeah. think is is really, really, it's, it's not right. Um, we are held to a standard that doesn't exist for men. Um, and yeah, I can say as much as I want about having your own internal confidence being boosted, but that it doesn't, it doesn't negate the fact that the current climate, especially within tech and funding is, is set up not for us. Um, I don't have the answers. I don't have all the answers for sure. Cause I'm definitely not there myself yet. Um, but I hope that with more female founders who have strong belief in what they're doing is great and bringing it to hopefully to a point where they can receive some funding for it. The more of us that exist, um, the more sway we're going to have over how that funding is proportioned out between people because, yeah, we know tech is biased um, in itself for men, white men. Um, and there's a certain level of privilege as well that needs to be accounted for on my own part. You know, my own experiences are deeply privileged because of the way I look, the way I sound. Um, there's a lot I can go into about that, but I'll probably save that for another day. But the actual advice that I'm providing myself is as someone who's definitely not figured it out yet, um, apart from to say that the the shift that I've seen is really been about challenging myself to to um, to not necessarily conform by any stretch. It's about learning your trade inside and out and being very aware of that external bias that you were talking about, which is very present on a daily basis. Mm. Have to somehow separate some of that yeah. negative incoming feedback yeah. to you know kind of go deeper within yourself yeah. and to just I suppose you just have to try harder <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a no lot, yeah and it's like you have to have such a brilliant idea yeah and have all of your ducks in a row yeah. and know every single thing inside out yeah and <laughs> but even then even then it doesn't work all the time you know even then there are brilliant ideas that fall at the wayside and I think that a lot of it is down to like I was saying you know uh, the privilege that I've got is is putting me in a position that a lot of women who don't look like me and don't sound like me would never ever have mm. um so it is about having the drive and the understanding of your own idea but then God, I don't know. It's such a big question to try and answer about how we solve the ultimately quite broken system that we have in terms of which companies <laughs> succeed and which companies fail ultimately because mm. the biggest biggest number for failure is, is cash flow. And very often with these large scalable businesses that take headlines, you need a lot of cash because mm -hmm. you're a debt-making business, at least at the start. Um, so drive being one thing, yeah, big thing, mm. but also that's something in the in the system has got to shift as well being a leader in your field what do you believe leadership is Ooh. yeah empathy um i think a lot of it is for me i'm still figuring it out but for me it's knowing i don't want to say there's always going to be a level of there's going to be difficult decisions and conversations you're going to need to have throughout your career as a leader. Um, it's about having empathy for yourself a lot of the time, as well as the people surrounding you that you are relying on to build a really successful entity. And I guess it's about understanding that an innate sense of secure um, attachment with who you are because you're going to face situations that people might not like. They might not always like you as a person. And I think, again, that's a, that's a very female thing to be concerned about people really liking you. You know, we're supposed to, we're supposed to want everyone to like us. That's what we've been taught throughout our lives. Um, and so I guess 
it's about having a strength of your own conviction, your own opinion, um, and making sure that the people surrounding you, every business is just built up of really fantastic people. And the strength of a business, I believe, is built from the strength of the team. And as a leader, it's your it's your job to make sure the team is is as strong as it possibly could be. And I think if you lead with empathy, then you're going to be in a pretty good position to hold human values very highly in every decision you make. Um, we're all humans at the end of the day, goes without saying. <laughs> but we all have our own set of priorities and circumstances that feed into how we're producing work. Um, and so, yeah, I could sit here and say, yeah, you've got to put the business first, you've got to put the business values first and foremost, but the business wouldn't exist without the people that you're surrounded with. Um, so empathy um, is probably my number one thing. Mm. I reserve this question for the end, mm. and which is the impossible question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what seems impossible to you now? But should Ooh. you achieve it, will change the course of your life or your business? Hmm. Impossible is a funny... It, yeah. I'm a deeply optimistic person, so nothing rarely... Rarely <laughs> does something feel completely impossible to me. Um, I guess it would be achieving what we want with the business that on, probably on a weekly basis, someone tells me is completely Im impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's someone else who will say uh, the phrase moonshot is a big one that is often thrown around. Everyone has a moonshot idea. We all, wanna, we all want the moonshot to, to succeed and to take off and be the thing that happens. I guess it's that. It's the vision of the project. It's the vision of where we want to get to with Zydro, taking it to a point where maybe we, you know, we run it for as long as we possibly can into many, many years, tens of years, um, and get to that mission statement of wanting to be the luxury virtual reality destination. Um, we want it to be a part of society in a lot of ways. And that moonshot is something that, it doesn't feel impossible to me because I believe in it, but I know a lot of people would say it's impossible. So I guess when that happens, that'll be the thing. So yeah. When that happens, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming onto the show, Nell. It's my pleasure. Thank pleasure you very to talk much. To you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.